It is Christmas week, and I hope that you have joy. What is joy? Joy is a great pleasure and or happiness, and our joy is ultimately found in Jesus. It is not found in our happenings, but ultimately the joy of Christmas needs to come through finding it in Jesus Christ. And if we were to be vulnerable with each other, sometimes there is not a lot of joy in Christmas. Sometimes we have heartache and we have struggle for different reasons, and Christmas is anything but joyous. So we are going to be in Hebrews 12, we're going to look at Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And as you find Hebrews chapter 12, I want to take you on a field trip. I will open up a little bit more of my life and my upbringings, and some of you are going to leave here going, oh, that makes so much more sense. I want to take you back to my days in junior high. Pennsylvania, they did 7th and 8th grade in my school district, and they called it junior high, 7th and 8th grade. They took us into the most wonderful class, which is physical education. And they took us through the Presidential Physical Fitness Award. Is anybody familiar with this? Okay. So in middle school, I should say junior high, 7th and 8th grade, the teachers would gather us together. We had a boy teacher and a girl teacher, one for each uh, boys and girls. And they would sit us down and they'd say, okay, we're going to do the presidential physical fitness. And we're going to see how many of you can do all of this work so that you can get this wonderful certificate signed by the President of the United States of America. Do you ever know those people that think after they speak? That would be me. Excuse me, I don't care about the certificate. Do I have to do this? It's probably not something you want to say to the gym teacher. So you had to do so many pull-ups and so many sit-ups and so many jumping jacks within a certain amount of time. And then you had the privilege and pleasure of running a mile. There is no joy in running a mile. So you knew it was coming and you knew that it was going to be difficult. Well, I knew it was going to be difficult because I want to let you in on a little secret that you already know, but I feel if I confess it, then you'll be able to uh, kind of move on. I'm not a runner. I'm not built like a runner. I have little desire to be a runner still to this day. But we had to do this. And the goal for me was I wanted to do well. I, I did. I wanted to do well. And I wanted to try to get at least a reputable, quote unquote, reputable time when I ran around the junior high. This is a junior high. It was in town. So it was a town block, give or take a town block. And we had to run four and a half laps around this wonderful building. I tried to fake sick, but they knew I couldn't do that, so I tried everything to get out of this running. So we went down to the corner, the bottom left corner, I'll call it, and the, fr and the first leg was completely flat. That's okay. But it was that second part that really bothered me because that's the incline. That was the hill that you had to run. Then he got to the corner and you made another left and it was, it was kind of flat, almost a little bit of a downgrade. And then the final leg, if you will, the fourth street was downhill. I'm all about the fourth leg. It's the first, second, and third leg I got to get to. And so the gym teacher, they would tell us, you need to do this. And you need to do this for the joy and the privilege and pleasure of possibly receiving the Presidential Physical Fitness Award. And I can remember thinking to myself two things. I've got to keep up with him or her because there are certain people you know they look like runners. Do you know who I'm talking about? There are those people, you look at them and they go, they're runners. So I wanted to try to do this, and so I always strategically placed myself near them, hoping that through some type of 
scientific thing, I could take their strength, energy, willpower, and desire and actually want to run. So I would always try to keep pace with them. They just never slowed down for me when I slowed down. I was okay in the first leg. That second leg, they were gone. And then I became discouraged, significantly discouraged, when they lapped me. They didn't slow down. They continued to lap me. And it ended up that, are you ready for this big surprise? I never received my Presidential Physical Fitness Award. That's why I am the way I am. And sometimes what happens is, after a while, I just quit. Didn't really put my heart into it. The one goal I did have was, don't be the last one. So there'd be a crew of people, for whatever reason, they just wouldn't run at all. They would walk. They would walk the mile. And I knew if I could finish in front of them, I wasn't dead last. But there's also a struggle within me saying, I want to do better. And I think sometimes when we enter into Christmas, friends, that's how we look at Christmas. I'd really rather not do it. There is no joy. There is no motivation. There is no happiness. Because there is no joy at Christmas. And that can be for whatever reason, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, relational, financial, that there's a struggle in the joy of Christmas this year. But as we look through this series and we look at the joy of Christmas, I want to look at Jesus because really when Jesus came born in a manger, his ultimate goal and life's desire was to die on the cross. I can remember sitting in my pre-algebra class if the building was there, I could take you to where I sat and you could see my fellow classmates running around and there was the, the congruent, oh, it's running day. And we all, I would say we, because I feel better talking about we, many of us would rather do something other than run. And Jesus, he came born of a virgin, came down, so that his very life could end on the cross. And he didn't do it begrudgingly. He didn't look up and say, oh, is there something else I could do? Is there a plan B? Is there someplace else I can go? Can I get a doctor's note and get out of this? Jesus, for the joy set before him, he ran the race. Let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Before we get to Hebrews 12, we need to do Hebrews chapter 11 really quick. Some people call it the hall of faith or the hall of fame about those men and women in the Old Testament that went before us, that set that example of walking in obedience to God's word. Now your homework this afternoon is I think you're going to want to do it because you can say, oh, the pastor gave us homework. I can't go out and shovel snow. I have to do my homework. You're welcome. You should go ahead and read Hebrews chapter 11. And then when it talks about Abraham, stop there and go back to Genesis 12 and read Genesis 12 through 30 about Abraham. When it talks about Joseph, read about Joseph. It talks about Jacob. Read about Jacob, Gideon, and uh, the others. Rebecca. Sarah, those men and women of the faith that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Because they were men and women that did not walk in perfection, but they were men and women that walked in obedience to God and his word. And so it's an encouragement to us to remember those that have gone on before us. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 tells us, therefore. So we come to the word therefore, we ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore? Well, that puts us in context that the author of Hebrews is going back and saying, remember Hebrews chapter 11. Remember those great cloud of witnesses, those men and women that went before us if you will, the Sunday school lessons that you learned so long ago. Look back and remember them. Remember the life that they lived and remember the faith that they had in the coming promised Messiah. So the author writes, therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, don't forget those that went before us. Don't forget the example that they set. 
Let us lay aside every encumbrance. Now, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask for a little bit of liberty. When I was running the race in junior high, I could have wore better clothes. I think that I didn't make the mile because I wore the wrong clothes. I wore the baggy gym shorts. If I would have wore the track and field outfit, I would have done it. Do you believe me? Second service did. Why can't you be like second service? (laughs) When I changed into my gym shorts, I did not wear the really slick, tight clothes that some of you wear in track and field. And I don't, wanna, I don't want you to leave here thinking I'm, I'm mocking track and field, I'm not. But I went and when I ran, there were some people that were really serious. They were serious about this, they were serious about running and they wanted that time. And their outfit, it matched their seriousness. You see, because when I ran in middle school, I wore the baggy clothes and that slowed me down. It added extra resistance. Now, friends, listen. (laughs) It didn't add that much. But go with me. A runner, a serious runner, is going to wear the running shorts. A serious runner is going to wear clothing that's a little bit more snug. A serious runner is not going to wear these type of shorts running in the Olympics for the gold medal. They're going to wear the appropriate clothing. The author of Hebrews says, let us also lay aside every encumbrance. We want to take the clothes that we're wearing and we want to tighten those up just a little bit more. We want to make sure that the clothes that we're wearing is matching and going for the goal that we are setting. And I just wonder if we're wearing the right clothing is really what the author's saying. And let us lay aside every encumbrance, the things that slow us down, and the sin which so easily entangles us. I'm not a runner. I have never been a runner, and I probably am not going to be a runner. But I do read about running, and that makes me an expert, right? And I watch TV about people that are runners, and I watch runners, and they, at the beginning of their race, they always tie their shoes, and they tie it multiple times. And sometimes they wear these really cool shoes that don't even have laces because they don't want anything to come untied. And, and the author of Hebrews says, let's make sure the garments that we have, that they don't cause us to slow down, that there's not extra resistance. And let's make sure that we don't become entangled by sin. The last thing we want as a runner is to look down and see our shoelaces are untied and step on our shoelace. That would be very, very bad. You know people that have done that in the Olympics. They have gotten their head out in front of their feet. They have tripped over their feet and they have gone head over heels and they've lost the opportunity to finish the race that they have worked so hard to do. The author says here, first of all, let's make sure we're wearing the right clothes. Let's make sure that we're wearing the right garments and that we we take it and we tuck it in. We tuck it and we make sure that they fit. Make sure that there's no extra slack as we run. You've all worked out, ran, or exercised in clothes that were too big and they became a hindrance or they slowed you down. Also, you've taken time to exercise and your shoes became untied. And we could stop the service and talk about those that we've seen in the gym take a a face plant on the treadmill or see those people that were on the track and field and they've tripped over their own two feet or they've caused someone else. We do not want to do that. The author says, let's tuck in our clothes, let's make sure they fit right, let's make sure we don't trip over sin that is in our life that so easily entangles us. Let us make sure, we make sure that we do not trip over those things. And let us run with endurance. All right, you have the picture of my middle school, high school, I'm sorry, junior high, in your mind. The front part, it was all level. The second leg, that was brutal. The third leg, it wasn't so bad. The fourth leg, it was wonderful. Remember, because the fourth leg is downhill. 
And when I started, I always started running next to the person that would set the pace for me to get that seven minute mile. That's what I wanted. And then the hill came. And that's where things, they got really difficult. And sometimes people would just quit. I'm not even going to do it. Some people, it liked the challenge and they went through it. And now I could say to you, maybe what I should have done is train better. Maybe I should have stretched more. I should have watched my diet. I should have exercised some more. I should have got some better clothes. And then I would be able to finish the race. And you would be absolutely right. You are 100% correct. But also, one thing that I've learned as I've watched and read is that you need to train. Because as I went down that front leg, everything was wonderful until the hill. I didn't have the endurance. And then guess what? I had the privilege and pleasure of doing that four and a half more times running that hill. And by the end, it was discouraging. And so the author says, when, since we have these witnesses, let's look at their example. Let's lay aside the garments that are going to cause us to slow down. Let's make sure we don't have things in front of us, that sin that's going to cause us to be entangled. And let's run with endurance because the race, it is not easy. It is not meant to be easy. The Presidential Physical Fitness Award, it's not meant to give out to everybody, but to those that have earned it. And so we need to run with endurance so that when times get tough, we can continue to run the race. The question I have for you this morning from verse 1 is, is there anything in my life slowing me down? Are you wearing the wrong size clothes? Is there something in your life that is causing you to have, if you will, an expansion? That's causing you to have more wind resistance in your life than you need? Is there something there that is slowing you down? Is there a sin that is in your life that you continually trip over? Is there anything there in your life that is causing you to slow down? I'm not a runner, but here's what I do know. If I'm in a race, I want to win and I don't want anything to slow me down. And as great, if you will, or funny as this illustration is, God has called us to live a life chasing after him. And friends, I wonder this morning, as you're running after Jesus, is there anything that's slowing you down? Is there anything that's tripping you up from pursuing him? The author continues and he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Now, I told you there was two gym teachers. I had a male and a female and they worked together. The female helped the girls and the male helped the boys. And the female teacher, she would always be there at the, at the bottom of the hill or over next to the, the big hill that we had to climb. And friends, it wasn't a huge hill. If I took you back there, it probably was flat, but in my mind it was big especially when you're running it. And she would stand at the bottom and says, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Just think about the certificate. That wasn't helpful. But then I did some reading about serious track athletes. And they don't look at the five feet in front of them. You know what they look at? They look at the finish line. And they continue to push through the pain for the finish line. As we think about Christmas this week, and if there's joy in Christmas, let us not forget what Christmas is about. It's about Jesus Christ and his birth. And as you wrestle through the difficulties in the season, don't look down. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. You look at eternity and don't look on the earth. Because, again, I'm not a runner. I've read about it. But you don't want to look down because then you're going to lose focus of where you're going. As a runner, you never look towards the audience or the crowd because then you're going to veer off track. You keep your eyes focused on that finish line. And you push through the pain and you keep running with all you've got. You fix your eyes on the finish line. 
In our life, the finish line is Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He was the author and the perfecter of our faith. He came to die. The very reason we celebrate the birth is because he had to come and die a death. And our faith is in him. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him. Think about that. He had joy set before him. Let me go on a little bit of a rabbit trail. When I was, I'm going to call it a younger parent. And I see some beautiful babies in this service. And it brings me back to whenever we had babies. And we went and we went down the toy aisle for the Fisher Price or the, the plastic toys. And you had to find that toy that everybody wanted. And you paid 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 dollars. Are you with me, parents? Because you had to have this toy. And this toy was the toy of all toys. This was going to make Christmas. Are you with me? And you have this toy and you wrap it up. And the baby or the little child opens up the toy. And you know what they play with? The box. Jesus, he came to earth to die. And he had complete joy doing it. He knew what was going to happen. Who for the joy set before him. He had joy. Now, there were many emotions that I experienced on the race day when I had to run the mile. Joy was the last emotion that I felt. And I tried to get out of it. I tried to make excuses. Jesus never made any excuses. He knew what was coming. He knew the cost. He knew the pain. He knew the trials. And yet he had joy. He had joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. One commentator went and put it this way. He said, what did Jesus endure? Well, Jesus was born to an unwed mother. That's what we're celebrating this week. Next, on Sunday, we will talk and have Christmas service online where we will celebrate the birth of Jesus. But he was born to an unwed mother anywhere from 13 to 16 years old. And back in the first century, that was scandalous. Jesus was born in a stable, whether it was a stable or a cave. He was born in primitive, very dirty conditions. And I can remember when our girls were born, we went out and we bought the cribs. The cribs that were 50, 70, 80, 100 dollars, whatever they were. We needed the best of the best of the best to put our beautiful bouncing baby girl into that crib. And here comes Jesus. And he's not put into a crib. He's put into a chiseled out rock that cows and animals ate out of. Do you know how dirty and disgusting cows and animals are when they eat? And that's what he laid in. Why? Because of his great love. And his great joy. His parents were poor. Mary and Joseph were very poor. He had a bounty on his head. People looked to kill him. He lived in the rough part of town. He lived in Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Oh, you're from Nazareth. Oh, that's where you're from. He went and lost his earthly father. Joseph passed away. Most commentators think he passed away before Jesus ever began his earthly ministry. So he has an unwed mother birth him, and then he loses his father, his earthly father, early in life. Did you know Jesus was homeless? Never had a place to call his home? People hated Jesus. And all he did was minister to them. He met their physical needs, their spiritual needs, their emotional needs. And most of all, he met their spiritual needs. And people's response were they hated him. They called him crazy. And like, oh, he's crazy. No, they looked at him and said, you are crazy. They even took it further enough and say, he's demon possessed. And Jesus knew this. He knew that people would receive him that way. And yet he went and came anyway. His family abandoned him. At his greatest hour of need, his family left him. His friends or the disciples left him. 
At his time that he needed them the most, the trial and the crucifixion, they left him. His close friend betrayed him. Judas betrayed him with a kiss. Peter said, hey, Jesus, no matter what they say or do, it's going to be okay. I'm going to be there. I'm your man. And Peter went and he swore to a little girl, 12 years old. Do you know Jesus? I don't even know him. And he uttered a curse. Jesus knew this. He had a fake trial where they made up accusations in the dead of night. And then he died a death. The worst death ever. That allow your mind to wander, but don't wander too far of the worst way to die. That was crucifixion. And Jesus came to die. And he died and he found joy in it. And I sometimes, I, I sit and marvel. I'll put it this way. I sit and I marvel at the love of Jesus had. And I marvel that he came and died a painful, painful death. And he found joy out of it. How did he find joy? Because he didn't look at the earthly. He kept his eye on the eternal. So when Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that he endured the cross, it was a painful, tremendously brutal way to die. But he looked at it and says, I have to have the pain first, the pleasure later. He kept his eye on the prize. And what was the prize? Eternity with you and me, that he opened up heaven. So he endured the cross. He despised the shame. All that he went through, physically, emotionally, relationally, he despised the shame and he knew it. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but Jesus does. And he came to earth born of a virgin and said, I do it for complete joy to be able to die on the cross. He knew every single thing that would happen and yet he still did it. And after he finished his task, his mission, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He, had, he came from heaven to earth, and then to get back to heaven, he needed to go through the cross. And he died that death, and we buried him. And then on Easter morning, we celebrate the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he went 40 days later, and he sat at the right hand of the Father. So you have God sitting on his throne in heaven. You have Jesus sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. In the first century, there was a lot of lawyer understanding and Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, you know what his job is? He's the advocate. He's the defense attorney for the person standing in front of God on trial. Aren't you glad that Jesus is your defense attorney? That's what he did. He came to earth to be born so that he could die, so that he comes back and he sits down and he sits next to God and God looks at you and Jesus says, they're with me. Tom's with me. His sin is on my account. And I can't prove it by scripture, but I would like you to lean in for a minute. I believe Jesus does it with a smile because of the joy set before him. That's why he did what he did. The reason you work overtime, the reason that you work to get that toy for your child, for your spouse, is because of the joy that it brings you to give. And Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, I paid for their debt, and he finds it joyful. The author says in verse 3, for consider Jesus who endured such hostility by sinners. I could keep going with things that Jesus endured. They did call him demon-possessed. They did crucify him. They did flog him. They made up stories about him. They rejected him. And he was treated so poorly. The king of kings endured the hostility by sinners for the joy set before him. So that you will not grow weary. Go back to my, I'm running around to school. It's the third lap. I'm tired. I'm not a runner. I'm discouraged. My legs hurt. My lungs hurt. My back hurts. My head hurts. 
that person that's running a six minute mile past me for the fourth time so I stuck out my foot and tripped them. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I became discouraged. And sometimes we become discouraged when we're running in this race and we feel like someone stuck out their foot and tripped us. And we look up and someone slows down and says, I'll run beside you. They can't run your race for you. They can't carry you. They can't even give you extra air. But what they can do is run beside you so you don't run alone. And so if you come to Christmas this year and there's every emotion but joy, my encouragement to you is to look to Jesus who came from heaven to earth to be born of a woman, suffered things he shouldn't have suffered so that we can have the opportunity of life everlasting. So he says, so that you will not grow weary. As I was thinking about this, there were times that people gave up. I'm not a runner, but what I've read and what I understand is the last thing you want to do in a race is to stop running. Always keep moving. Even if you have to run one mile an hour, keep moving. Keep moving. So here comes Jesus. And if you're tired, and if you're joyless, and you're growing weary, look to Jesus and don't lose heart. One of the blessings would be, as you're running up that hill, to slow down and encourage somebody else. You know you can't carry them. They know you can't carry them. But it's just nice to run beside somebody else. So the final question I have, am I going through a difficult stretch of the race this Christmas? Maybe you're running on a flat ground. It's not too hard. It's not too easy. It's just, it just kind of is what it is, if you will. Maybe you're on the downhill slope and it, you've hit your groove and you're not even breathing out of your mouth. I mean, it's just, you've hit that groove and life is really good. But maybe you're on the right side of the school and you're running up that hill and it's hard. And it's difficult. And I just wonder if you're running through a difficult stretch of a race this Christmas. Because as I run, there is no joy in running. But it's always better to run beside someone else. Two questions this morning. Is there anything slowing me down? Is there something in your life that needs, that you need to take the slack out of? Tighten those shorts a little bit. Get a little less wind resistance. Shrink them down so that there's less slowing you down. Maybe you need to stop and tie your shoe and get rid of that sin in your life that keeps tripping you on the course. And then I also wonder as you run through life, if you're going through a difficult part. A part. But then I like to put a third question in there. Maybe you're looking at me saying, you know what? Uh, I've, my clothes are fitting pretty well. My shoes are tied. I don't really have any big sin. I'm not going through a difficult, difficult stretch. I've actually hit my stride. And it's going really, really well. Then I would encourage you to, to look around. Because you're the one that runs really, really well. Maybe there's somebody like me that isn't in the best shape that's struggling running up the hill and you could slow down and run beside them and encourage them. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Let me run beside you so you don't run alone. Let's close our time in a word of prayer. As you close your Bibles, my desire is not to call you out by name or to embarrass you or have you come forward. Just want to pray for you as, you as a pastor. And I just wonder if there's anybody here that would be vulnerable with me and just say, would you pray for me? Because 
there is something slowing me down. Whether it's something that's gotten stretched and needs to be tightened, whether there's a sin, there's something slowing you down in a race of life. And you're saying, would you pray for me that I can get that taken care of? Would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip your hand up so I can pray for you? I see that hand. Thank you. Two hands are up. Three, four, five, six. Anybody else? See those seven, eight. Thank you. Is there anybody here this morning that would say, I'm going through a difficult time. In this race of life, there is no joy. I'm running uphill and I'm just discouraged. Would you pray for me that I could have joy this Christmas season? Is there anybody I could pray for this morning? See those two hands, three, four, five. Lord, I'm so thankful for your word. It's Christmas. And we always have joy at Christmas, but sometimes Christmas can get lost in the hustle and bustle. And sometimes that hustle and bustle is, is the clothes have gotten stretched or there's something in front of us, Lord, that has tripped us. And that can become a discouraging part of the race. Lord, for those that with the uplifted hand or their hearts were lifted even if their hands were not. I pray that you might help us to recognize something that is slowing us down and then take time to tighten it up. Lord, for those that are going through the hills of life and it's a difficult run and a difficult stretch, I pray that they might look to you who endured the cross, its suffering and shame and despised. And then for the joy set before you, you endured all that. I pray that they might be able to look to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Lord, help them to find joy in Jesus. And maybe there's somebody here that would say, I've had my eye on the wrong prize. It's been the things of this world. Lord, help them to turn their eyes upon you. Lord, if there's somebody here that does not know you, may you put holy discontent into their hearts and drive them to go see a pastor. To have a conversation saying, I need to keep my eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. We're so thankful for Christmas. May we find joy not in the presence under the tree, but in the worship of the Messiah, who is Christ the King. It's in his name that I pray. Amen.